This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 1990, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1990. We also look at the case for putting Salt and Peppa into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1990. In music, Leonard Bernstein ended his conducting career by conducting the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He later passed away in October of 1990. It was confirmed that Millie Vanilli did not sing on their debut album. They were then stripped of their Grammy Award for Best New Artist because of this, becoming the first artist to have their Grammys taken away from them. Actually, 1990 was the year of controversy in music, as you'll see when we hit the hip-hop and dance music sections. MTV Unplugged premiered to not much fanfare. Squeeze was the first act to be featured. Gloria Estefan was severely injured when her tour bus crashed. She would eventually recover. Roger Waters, along with an all-star list of artists, performed Pink Floyd's classic album The Wall in front of what remained of the Berlin Wall as the wall and what was left of communism in Eastern Europe was in the process of being dismantled. Curtis Mayfield was paralyzed when lighting equipment fell on him during a performance in Brooklyn, New York. Madonna did her controversial Blonde Ambition tour, along with releasing her controversial video for Justify My Love. Some of the biggest selling albums of the year were Sinead O'Connor's I Do Not Want What I Have Not Got, MC Hammer's Please Hammer Don't Hurt Em, Vanilla Ice's To The Extreme, New Kids on the Block Step by Step, Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation 1814, Bonnie Raitt's Nick of Time, Paul Abdul's Forever Your Girl, Phil Collins's But Seriously, and Millie Vanilli's Girl You Know It's True Before Their Scandal Broke. Some of those albums, like Bonnie Raitt's, came out in 1989 but became huge sellers in 1990, mainly because of the amount of Grammy Awards that they won. 1990 was also the year that ambient music continued to break through with Enigma's album MCMXCAD and the songs Sadness Part 1 and Mea Culpa. And everybody either pronounces it Chardayness or Sadness. It's actually Sad, as in the Marquis de Sade. Classical music came front and center again in 1990 as the singing supergroup The Three Tenors, consisting of Jose Carreras, Placido Domingo, and Luciano Pavarotti, released their album Carreras, Domingo, Pavarotti, and Concert, which became the biggest selling classical music of all time with worldwide sales of over 10 million copies. Wilson Phillips had one of the biggest hits of 1990 with the song Hold On. Other big songs of 1990 included Sinead O'Connor's Nothing Compares to You, Belle Biv DeVoe's Poison, with, of course, the iconic advice, Never Trust a Big Butt in a Smile, Words to Live By, Word to Your Mother. Sorry, that's Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby, which was also a big hit. Madonna's Vogue from the Dick Tracy soundtrack was also a huge hit, as were Roxette's It Must Have Been Love and Go West's King of Wishful Thinking, both from the Pretty Woman soundtrack. There was also Mariah Carey's Vision of Love, Faith No More's Epic, James Ingram's I Don't Have the Heart, Maxi Priest's Close to You, Stevie B's Because I Love You, the Postman song. Alias is More Than Words Can Say, Phil Collins is Another Day in Paradise, En Vogue's Hold On, Depeche Mode's Enjoy the Silence, The Soup Dragon's I'm Free, Tony Tony Tony's Feels Good, Alana Miles' is Black Velvet, Jane Child's Don't Want to Fall in Love, Lisa Stanfield's All Around the World, Whitney Houston's I'm Your Baby Tonight, Concrete Blonde's Joey, 
Billy Idol's Cradle of Love from the Adventures of Ford Fairlane soundtrack, and John Bon Jovi's Blaze of Glory from the Young Gun soundtrack. And if you're guessing that 1990 was a really good year for some good songs, you are not kidding. All of those songs are really, really good. In rock music, there were big hits like the Black Crow's Shake Your Money Maker, ACDC's The Razor's Edge, Extreme's Porno Graffiti, Damn Yankee's self-titled album, Nelson's debut album, Queen's Reich's Empire, Jane's Addiction's Ritual de lo Habitual, Megadeth's Rust in Peace, The Charlatans' Some Friendly, Living Colors' Time's Up, Warrant's Cherry Pie, Scorpion's Crazy World, Trickster's self-titled album, Slaughter's Stick It To You, Pantera's Cowboys From Hell, Concrete Blonde's Bloodletting, Obituary's Cause of Death, Anthrax's Persistence of Time, Biohazard's self-titled album, Wingers in the Heart of the Young, and Y&T's 10. 1990 seemed to be the last gasp of the hairband era as grunge and then rock alternative would rule the rest of the decade starting in 1991. In country music, 1990 was a big year for country crossovers onto the pop chart, led by Garth Brooks, whose album No Fences became one of the biggest selling albums of all time, with 18 million copies sold. Other top selling country albums included Randy Travis's Heroes and Friends, George Strait's Living It Up, Clint Black's Put Yourself in My Shoes, Ricky Van Shelton's RVS3. Hank Williams Jr.'s Lone Wolf, Reba McIntyre's Rumor Has It, Travis Tritt's Country Club, Alabama's Pass It On Down, and Alan Jackson's Here in the Real World. The Billboard Country Singles Chart began being tabulated from radio airway only and not by single sales. So because of this, only 23 songs hit number one that year on the Country Singles Chart. They included Garth Brooks's The Dance, along with his hit Friends in Low Places, Joe Diffie's Home, Clint Black's Nobody's Home, and also Walking Away, Alabama's Jukebox in My Mind, and also their hit Southern Nights, Lori Morgan's Five Minutes, Dan Seals' Good Times, Keith Whitley's It Ain't Nothing, and Shenandoah's Next to You, Next to Me. In hip-hop, 1990 was the year that suburban moms started to like rap music, as it was called back then, as Vanilla Ice's album To the Extreme and MC Hammer's Please Hammer Don't Hurt Em watered down rap music to the point where they even made a Saturday morning cartoon starring Hammer and some cartoon kids. Both albums became huge sellers. Ice would end up having two major problems, though. Actually, three if you count Suge Knight's bodyguards dangling him off of a balcony in order to get Ice to sign over the rights to his song Ice Ice Baby. Speaking of that song, that was one of his other problems because it also got him into a lot of trouble with the group Queen for sampling their song Under Pressure. He claimed that it was okay to do it because he changed one note in the melody. He also said that he grew up on the streets in the hoods of Dallas when, in fact, he grew up rich in the Dallas suburbs, leading to accusations of cultural appropriation, which were actually accurate. Well, at least he gave us Go Ninja Go from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle 2 movie. Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go, Go Ninja, Go. No, no. Okay. Never mind. Moving on. Other big selling and groundbreaking albums included LL Cool J's Mama Said Knock You Out, Ice Cube's America's Most Wanted, DJ Polo's Wanted, Dead or Alive, Public Enemy's Fear of a Black Planet, Eric B. and Rakim's Let the Rhythm Hit Em, A Tribe Called Quest's debut album, People's Instinctive Travels and the Paths of Rhythm, Above the Law's Living Like Hustlers, Brand Nubian's One for All, EPMD's Business as Usual, Boogie Down Productions' Edutainment, Special Ed's Legal, X-Clan's To the East Blackwords, Digital Underground Sex Packets, and D-Nice's Call Me D-Nice. Top Hip Hop singles in 1990 included Mama Said Knock You Out from LL Cool J, Bonita Applebum from Tribe Call Quest, Boogie Down Productions' Love's Gonna Get You, 
Public Enemies, Burn, Hollywood, Burn, Ice Cubes, Jack and for Beat, Poor Righteous Teachers, Rock This Funky Joint, NWA's 100 Miles and Running, Eric B. and Rakim's Let the Rhythm Hit Em, Brand Nubians Slow Down, Two Shorts, The Ghetto, and the iconic Biz Marquee song, Just a Friend. No, I'm not going to even sing. Okay, sure. Oh, baby, you, you got what I need. But you say he just a friend. But you say he just a friend. Oh, baby. Okay, that's enough. Anyway, in dance music, while the traditional dance charts were still filled with the usual pop rap remix crossovers that polluted the charts back in the day, it was the year of Eurodance, and house music had their day in the sun, at least in the beginning. Songs like Everybody, Everybody, and Strike It Up by Black Box and Gonna Make You Sweat, Everybody Dance Now by CNC Music Factory were huge, but came with a lot of controversy. We'll discuss that controversy in a minute. Other hit dance songs included Snaps the Power, Delight's Groove is in the Heart, DNA's remix of Suzanne Vega's a cappella song, Tom's Diner, London Beats' I've Been Thinking About You, Soho's Hippie Chick, Beats International's Dub Be Good to Me, Sweet Sensation's Love Child, the remake of the Supremes hit, Two in a Room's Wiggle It, 808 State's Cubic, Adamski's The Space Jungle, Technotronic's This Beat is Technotronic. DJ Albin's Hello Africa, Happy Monday's Step On, and Kathy Dennis's All Night Long. DJ Mag started in 1991, so that of course meant that there was no best DJ poll in 1990. 1990 was the year of vocals controversy, possibly in part because of the whole Millie Vanilli fallout. You know, kind of like how when a major business gets busted for fraud, five more business frauds pop up out of the woodwork all of a sudden. This time, the controversy surrounded the former singer in the group The Weather Girls, of its reigning men fame, Miss Martha Wash. Martha Wash was paid flat fees to sing demo tracks for the producers of the group's Black Box and CNC Music Factory. Black Box then used Martha's vocals on most of their debut album, including their hit Everybody Everybody, and CNC Music Factory used her vocals on Gonna Make You Sweat Everybody Dance Now, which came out late in 1990 but became huge in 1991. Not only did the groups not give Martha vocal credit for her work, but both groups replaced her with thin models in the music videos and during tour appearances, as the models were thin and beautiful, and Martha was beautiful, but not exactly thin. After Martha tried and failed to work out an agreement with both groups, she then sued them. Black Box in 1990 and CNC Music Factory in 1991. Both lawsuits were settled out of court with Martha finally getting vocal credits and whatever royalties that come with that distinction. Top Latin artists for 1990 included Daniela Romo, Ana Gabriel, Roberto Carlos, Jose Luis Rodriguez, Bronco, Maz, Los Tigres del Norte, Rudy Lascala, Los Bucas, Jose Jose, Ricardo Montaner, Kaioma, Vicente Fernandez, Los Yonix, Luis Enrique, Frankie Ruiz, Juan Luis Guerrera, and 4.4, Juan Manuel Lebron, and La Patrulla 15. Musicals or revivals of musicals included Five Guys Named Mo, City of Angels, Gypsy, Jekyll and Hyde, and Shogun the Musical. Musical films of 1990 included Dick Tracy, Graffiti Bridge, Mo Better Blues, House Party, Lombada, The Forbidden Dance, and Cry Baby. Bands that got together in 1990 included Seven Year Bitch, Ace of Bass, Another Bad Creation, Bikini Kill, Blessed Union of Souls, Body Count, The Brian Setzer Orchestra, Brooks and Dunn, Candlebox, Blind Melon, Captain Hollywood Project, Charles and Eddie, Catherine Wheel, Chimera, 
Christ Agony, Cause and Effect, Contraband, The Coors, Curve, Diablo, Crowbar, Demigod, Enigma, H-Town, House of Pain, Immortal, Juno Reactor, K-Town Clan, The Lynch Mob, Letters to Cleo, M People, Robin Fab, The Real Millie Vanilli, ROC, Revolver, The Prodigy, Pearl Jam, The Party, Entrance, New Power Generation, Tool, Travis, TLC, The Three Tenors, Wild Orchid, Stereo Lab, Steelheart, Take That, Temple of the Dog, and Escape. Groups who either broke up before, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus included Living in a Box, Mr. Mr., Mother Love Bone, The Blow Monkeys, Camper Van Beethoven, Complex, Spandau Ballet, Eurythmics, The Del Fuegos, The Snapdragons, Wang Chung, White Snake, The Jazz Messengers, Hindu Love Gods, and Shalimar. Artists who were born in 1990 included Machine Gun Kelly, Rita Ora, The Weeknd, Iggy Azalea, SZA, Logic, Andy Biersack of Black Veil Brides, Soldier Boy, Black Bear, B. Simone, Sean Kingston, Luke Combs, Hozier, Mandy Capisto of Monroe's, Jojo, and Jung Yun of Shiny. Artists who unfortunately passed away in 1990 included blues guitar great Stevie Ray Vaughan, who passed away in a helicopter accident, conductor Leonard Bernstein, the aforementioned, guitarist Alan Collins of Leonard Skinnerd, Tom Fogarty of Creedence Clearwater Revival, singer Del Shannon, Peter Swayval of Looking Glass, singer Johnny Ray, Rick Gretsch of Blind Faith, Andrew Wood of Mother Love Bone, the legendary jazz artist, Miss Sarah Vaughn, saxophonist Dexter Gordon, singer Floyd Butler, Stiff Baters of the Dead Boys, trumpet player Clyde McCoy, Brent Midland of the Grateful Dead, entertainer extraordinaire Miss Pearl Bailey, Lou DeWitt of the Statler Brothers, B.J. Wilson of Procol Harum, jazz drummer Art Blakey, band leader Xavier Cugat, and composer Aaron Copeland. In award ceremonies for the music of 1990, Quincy Jones won Album of the Year for Back on the Block, Song of the Year went to Bette Midler's From a Distance, Record of the Year went to Phil Collins for Another Day in Paradise, and Mariah Carey took home Best New Artist at the Grammy Awards for that year. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Sinead O'Connor won Video of the Year for Nothing Compares to You. At the American Music Awards, Phil Collins, Janet Jackson, and Aerosmith were the big winners. MC Hammer won Entertainer of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. Phil Collins, Janet Jackson, and Gloria Estefan were the big winners at the Billboard Music Awards. MC Hammer, Paul Abdul, and Vanilla Ice won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. George Strait won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, while Garth Brooks won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. The Fine Young Cannibals won Best British Album for The Raw and the Cooked, and Phil Collins won Best Song for Another Day in Paradise at the Brit Awards. The Tragically Hip won Artist of the Year, Celine Dion won Best Album for Unison, while Colin James won Best Song for Just Came Back at the Juno Awards. Midnight Oil won Album of the Year for Blue Sky Mine, and Absent Friends won Song of the Year for I Don't Want to Be With Nobody But You at the Aria Music Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Zagreb, Croatia, which at the time was part of Yugoslavia, Toto Akutuno from Italy won for the song In Sieme 1992. At the Tony Awards, City of Angels won Best Musical and Gypsy won Best Revival of a Musical. For the Academy Award Music Categories, John Barry's soundtrack to Dances with Wolves won Best Film Score and the Stephen Sondheim written song Sooner or Later I Always Get My Man from Dick Tracy won Best Song. Mel Powell won the Pulitzer Prize for Music for the piece Duplicates, a Concerto for Two Pianos and Orchestra. The Mercury Music Prize started in 1992. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on January 17th at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. Highlights included Kinks lead singer Ray Davies saying, quote, 
Rock and roll has become respectable. What a bummer. End quote. Keith Moon's daughter, Mandy Moon, accepted the award on her late father's behalf when the Who were inducted. She reminded everyone that her father was actually banned from the Waldorf Astoria during his lifetime. Actually, Keith was banned from a lot of hotels during his lifetime due to him constantly trashing them. During the ceremony, the Hall inducted the songwriting team of Holland Dozier Holland, who we'll talk about at relative length later on, along with Jerry Goffin and Carol King into the non-performers category. Louis Armstrong, Charlie Christian, and Ma Rainey were inducted into the early influencers category. In the performers category, the hall inducted Hank Ballard, Bobby Darin, The Four Seasons, The Kinks, The Platters, The Who, Simon and Garfunkel, and this next group. The group The Four Tops started out as a couple of high school singing duos in Detroit, Michigan. Levi Stubbs and Abdul Duke Fakir sang together at Pershing High School, while Ronaldo O.B. Benson and Lawrence Payton sang together at Northern High School. After their mutual friends told them about each other, they decided to all get together and sing at a local birthday party. They liked their harmony so much that they decided to make it a permanent group. They originally called themselves the Four Ames before eventually calling themselves the Four Tops so they wouldn't be confused with the group the Ames Brothers, which were popular at that time. Lawrence Payton had a cousin who was a songwriter named Raquel Billy Davis. Through Raquel, the group got a recording contract with Chess Records. For the first few years of their careers, they bounced around between Chess Records, Riverside Records, Red Top Records, and Columbia Records without any success. Where they had success was on the touring circuit. It was while they were on the road that they honed their performing skills and became a wanted opening act for artists such as Billy Eckstein. In 1963, a man entered the picture who changed the group's lives. Barry Gordy was the owner for Motown Records, who was just beginning to make a name for itself in the industry. Before he owned Motown, though, Barry was a successful songwriter, and during his songwriting days, he met and worked with Raquel Billy Davis. In 1963, Barry saw the Four Tops and decided that he needed to have the group join the Motown family. It took some arm twisting. Both sides were taking a chance on each other, but the Four Tops decided to sign a record deal with Motown. Their success, however, was not instantaneous. The group first recorded jazz standards for a Motown subsidiary called Workshop Jazz Records and did backup vocals for fellow Motown artists like the Supremes and Martha and the Vandellas. In 1964, the group was partnered with the songwriting and production team of Holland Dozier Holland. HDH, as they were nicknamed, took an instrumental track that they had laying around, gave it more of a pop R&B feel to it, and worked some lyrics around the Four Tops as vocals. That song became the group's first big hit, Baby I Need Your Loving which just missed the top 10 on the Billboard Pop Singles chart, landing at number 11. They ended 1964 with the songs Without the Ones You Love and Ask the Lonely, both of which did okay, but not spectacular. 1965 and 1966 were the years when the group really hit their stride. They had their first number one hit, I Can't Help Myself, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch, in late spring 1965. From there, the group went on a roll, racking up big hits like It's the Same Old Song, Something About You, Shake Me, Wake Me, and Loving You is Sweeter Than Ever. For most songs that were written and produced by HDH, they made the song specifically for Levi Stubbs' deep lead vocals and tight harmonies for the other guys. Being Motown and having an assembly line way of doing things, Motown artists would routinely show up on each other's songs. In the Four Tops' case, that meant that HDH would have the female group, the Andantes, routinely do the high-pitched backup vocals on a lot of the tracks. 
On August 17, 1966, the Four Tops released what became their signature song and biggest hit, Reach Out, I'll Be There, which went to number one on the Billboard Pop and R&B singles charts and also went to number one on the UK singles charts. That was followed up by another huge hit, Standing in the Shadows of Love. They followed those songs up in 1967 with the hits Bernadette, Seven Rooms of Gloom, You Keep Running Away, and If I Were a Carpenter, and rode that momentum into 1968 with Walk Away Renee. By this point in their careers, the Four Tops and the Temptations were Motown's best-selling artists in America and in the U.K., the Temptations were number one in America with the Four Tops at number two, while the Four Tops were number one in Great Britain with the Temptations being number two. Storm clouds, though, started to gather through no fault of their own and started to interfere with their careers. Those storm clouds were Holland Dozier Holland, or rather their relationship with label head Barry Gordy. Barry Gordy was known as a visionary and a great businessman who built a small record label up into a worldwide juggernaut and did it in less than a decade. However, his treatment of some of his artists and especially his behind-the-scenes workers was sometimes not the best to be nice about it. Some of his artists left over financial and creative differences. Among those were Marvin Gaye, The Jackson 5, and as you'll see in a minute, the Four Tops. His treatment of the studio musicians known as the Funk Brothers, who played on a lot of Motown hits, was extremely bad. So much so that when they held the Motown 25 TV special, that was the special where people first saw Michael Jackson perform the moonwalk, the Funk Brothers were disrespectfully barely even mentioned. The same issues plagued Motown's relationship with Holland Dozier Holland, who finally had enough and left Motown in 1968. That left Motown without one of the greatest songwriting and production teams of all time who could write for a number of different artists. That also left the Four Tops without a team who they could rely on. They worked with other songwriters like Nicholas Ashford and Valerie Simpson, who later became the singing-songwriting duo Ashford and Simpson, and Ivy Joe Hunter, but it really wasn't the same. The Four Tops finally scored a hit in 1970 with It's All in the Game and even released a concept album in 1970 called Still Waters Run Deep. They also released a couple of albums with the Supremes under the alias The Magnificent Seven. Once Motown moved to Los Angeles from Detroit and told everyone that if they wanted to stay with the label, then they would have to move with them, the writing was on the wall. Some of the older Motown artists got pushed to the wayside for the newer artists. Some decided to just simply stay in Detroit, like the Funk Brothers and also the Four Tops. The Four Tops joined the record label ABC Dunhill instead and released what turned out to be their first top 10 hit in five years, 1972's Keeper of the Castle. They followed that up with seven top 20 hits in the early 1970s, including Ain't No Woman Like the What I Got. The group's last hit with ABC Dunhill was 1976's Catfish. After that, Nothing much came from that partnership, and they left the label for Casablanca Records in 1981, where they got a major hit with When She Was My Girl. In 1983, the Four Tops found themselves back at Motown Records after one of their producers at ABC Dunhill found himself a new job at Motown as vice president of A&R and talked the Four Tops into coming back to the label. The group was also reunited with... Holland Dozier Holland, who had started working with the label again. HDH produced a bunch of songs for their new 1983 album, Back Where I Belong. The group performed on the Motown 25 special, did a tour with The Temptations, put out another album for Motown, and performed at the American portion of Live Aid. After that, they were done with Motown again and jumped ship to Arista Records in 1987, where they landed their last top 40 songs, Indestructible and Loco in Acapulco, in 1988. 
Levi Stubbs released a song with Aretha Franklin called If Ever a Love There Was, which became a minor hit. Levi also started lending his voice to movies, most notably as the voice of Audrey II in the 1986 reboot of the film Little Shop of Horrors. That's the one with Rick Moranis and Steve Martin. Feed me, Seymour! On December 21st, 1988, the Four Tops were recording a performance on the British music TV show Top of the Pops. Then they were supposed to take a flight from London, England, back to America after that. However, due to the recording session going long, they missed their original flight and had to take a later flight on British Airways. It was a good thing that they missed their original flight, because their original flight was Pan Am Flight 103, which was blown up by terrorists who were connected to Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi while the plane was flying over Lockerbie, Scotland. All aboard were killed, which would have meant that all four members of the Four Tops would have died that day. After that life-altering brush with death, the group concentrated on doing more touring and less on recording, although they still did a little bit, like doing songs with Aretha Franklin and jazz great Grover Washington Jr., The original group's final album was their 1995 Christmas album, Christmas Here With You. From the beginning, the Four Tops had always been Levi Stubbs, Abdul Duke Fakir, Ronaldo Obi Benson, and Lawrence Payton. That's over 40 years together without a member leaving even once, which is almost unheard of. That all changed on June 20th, 1997, when Lawrence Payton passed away from liver cancer at the age of 59. The group tried working as a trio for a while, but decided to recruit former Temptation member Theo Peoples to take Lawrence's spot. Levi Stubbs, meanwhile, developed cancer, but lived long enough to make an appearance at the Four Tops 50th anniversary concert. Levi Stubbs passed away on October 17, 2008, at the age of 72. Ronnie McNair joined the group and took over Lawrence's spot, while Theo became the lead singer, taking over Levi's spot. Ronaldo Obi Benson passed away from cancer a few years earlier, actually, on July 1, 2005, at the age of 69, and was replaced by Lawrence's son, Lawrence Payton Jr., There was also Harold Spike Bonhart, who joined the group from 2010 to 2018, taking over Theo's spot when he retired. Alexander took over Spike's spot when he retired. Abdul Duke Fakir was the last of the original members to pass away, performing until 2024 before passing away from heart failure on July 22, 2024, at the age of 88. The lineup as it stands right at this moment consists of Ronnie McNair, Lawrence Payton Jr., Alexander Morris, and Michael Brock, who took over Duke's spot early in 2024 when Duke officially retired from the group. The reconstituted group still go out and tour the world to this day. I kind of have mixed emotions about seeing them, since the guys who sang the songs that were so big are no longer around. It's kind of like going to see Bon Jovi or Def Leppard and have it be essentially a tribute cover band with no original members and with either John Bon Jovi or Joe Elliott's kid singing lead. That would be a little strange. Anything to keep the group's memory alive, I guess, though. Just my opinion. The Four Tops, the original ones, that is, released 27 studio albums, two live albums, and 10 compilation albums. Of those, 23 hit the top 40 on the American charts, with 12 of those 23 going top 10, including their debut self-titled album going to number one on the R&B chart. In Europe, eight of those albums hit the top 40, including five which went to the top 10, those Five top 10 albums happened in the UK. They also released 59 singles of those. 42 hit the top 40 on the American charts with 23 of those 42 going top 10, including three of them going to number one. 
internationally. 27 hit the top 40 charts, with 10 of those 27 going top 10, including Reach Out, I'll Be There, going to number one on the UK charts. As good as the group was, though, they only received one Grammy Award nomination, which they did not win. They did, however, receive a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009, and they've been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame twice, once for the song Reach Out, I'll Be There in 1998, and once for I Can't Help Myself, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch in 2018. The Four Tops were inducted into the Vocal Group Hall of Fame in 1999 and the National Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame in 2013. They received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1997, and when they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990, all of the original members were there to accept the honor. Presented for induction by 1989 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Stevie Wonder, Levi Stubbs, Abdul Duke Fakir, Lawrence Payton, and Ronaldo Obi Benson. The Four Tops, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990, and we have put their greatest hits onto this week's podcast music playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This week, we're going to make the case for putting the trailblazing New York City all-female rap group salt and Peppa into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I say group because it was not just Cheryl Salt James or Sandra Peppa Denton, but also people tend to forget their DJ, Deidre Spinderella Roper. Spinderella spin it up one time. As always, to the tale of the tape we go. Salt and Peppa released five studio albums and six compilation albums. Of those, all five of their studio albums hit the top 40 on the American charts, with three of those albums going top 10, their highest charting being 1993's Very Necessary, which hit number four. They sold 15 million albums worldwide. They also released 27 singles. Of those, 12 hit the top 40 on the American charts, with 7 of those 12 going top 10, including 3 at number 1, 1989's Expression, along with 1993's Shoop, and their duet with En Vogue, What a Man. Along with those songs, they had cult classics like Push It, Let's Talk About Sex, and None of Your Business. As far as their influence goes, they were the first female rap artist to get both a gold and platinum album when their debut album, Hot, Cool, and Vicious, did both when it was released back in 1986. Both they and Queen Latifah were the first female rap artists to win Grammy Awards, as they both won Grammy Awards on the same night. They were nominated for four American Music Awards, winning none of them, six Grammy Awards, winning two, including a Lifetime Achievement Award, five MTV Video Music Awards, winning three of those, and they received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2022. They've been eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since 2011, yet they have not gotten the nod. I suspect that they will in the next five years now that the Hall has finally decided that female rappers do deserve to be inducted. They should have honestly have been inducted a long time ago, and they fully deserve to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And to prove it, we threw their Greatest Hits album onto this week's podcast playlist as well. 
the link to which, as I said before, is in the show notes. This week's Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. The Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Nashville, Tennessee, and was opened on April 1st, 1967, but they started inducting members into the hall in 1961. The museum has almost 200,000 recordings and an extensive collection of memorabilia. The museum is located at 222 Fifth Avenue South and is open daily from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. except on Thursdays when they're closed. Ticket prices are anywhere between $28 to $72, depending on packages. Kids 6 through 12 are $18 to $57, depending on packages, and is one of Nashville's biggest tourist attractions, even though it is expensive as, well, let's just say it's expensive. Go to countrymusichalloffame.org for more information, along with updated ticket pricing and hours of operation, since things tend to shift according to the weather, and you also may have to reserve your tickets now in advance. There is no denying Ray Charles's musical genius. He helped to invent soul music by combining rhythm and blues, jazz, and gospel. He also helped to integrate country music with pop and R&B in order to help it cross over. According to Rolling Stone magazine, Charles is the second greatest singer of all time and the tenth greatest artist of all time. Ray was born on September 23, 1930 in Georgia. Ray's grandfather gave up custody of his mother, Aretha, to a family friend because Ray's grandmother had passed away and the grandfather couldn't afford to keep Ray's mother. That family friend named Bailey had an affair with Ray's mother, which created a huge scandal at that time in that part of the country. And Ray was actually the byproduct of that affair. Ray started to learn the piano at the age of three. At the age of five, he developed a case of glaucoma and became completely blind. His mother fought for Ray to go to a school for blind children in St. Augustine, Florida, but when Ray was 14, his mother passed away. He left school after the funeral. Ray started playing piano for other people in Jacksonville, Florida, and then moved to Orlando, Florida, and did the same thing, although at that point, the playing opportunities had dried up because it was post-World War II, and all the soldiers had gone back home, and that area had a lot of military bases. Ray found it tough going for a little while, sometimes going without food. He also had enough of playing for other people, and he wanted to play with his own band. Ray followed a friend of his out to Seattle, Washington, but not before recording a few songs, which are the earliest known recordings of his. In Seattle, a couple of things happened that would have a consequence on popular music. The first was that he befriended a 15-year-old boy named Quincy Jones. The legendary Q would end up becoming lifelong friends with Ray and would work with him, with Quincy making his own impact on music, including producing the biggest selling album of all time worldwide, Michael Jackson's Thriller album. The second thing was that Ray finally got to start his own traveling band. In 1949, Ray had his first major hit called Confession Blues. A few more hits came along, and Ray started making a name for himself. After a few years of being on smaller labels, he signed a record deal with Atlantic Records, which made him extremely successful for the time. He still didn't quite have a lot of crossover success, but two things changed that. One was a song, and the other was an album. In 1959, Charles was 10 years into his career. He and his band were playing a show in Brownsville, Pennsylvania. He was playing what were known at the time as meal shows, where you'd play for a couple of hours, take a break, and then play for a couple more hours. On this particular night, the band had played through their second set way too quickly and had about 12 minutes left to kill. 
Charles had to think fast, so he told the band to start playing a fast blues beat and to follow what he did. He started playing a simple melody, made up words that didn't really make any sense, and did a call and response with his backup singers. The audience went wild when the song was done. Charles decided to record this song after that. In February of 1959, Charles went into the recording studio to record the song at Atlantic Records Studio. That song, What I Say, was one of two that they recorded that day and was recorded in four takes with no overdubs. That was because the band had played it enough during their tour that they didn't need to work it out in the studio. There were a few problems with What I Say, though. The first was that the original version of the song was over seven minutes long. They decided to cut the song into two parts. Part two is the more famous part. The second is that there were some phrases in the call and response parts that were deemed questionable by 1959 standards, such as shake that thing. Go figure. Those parts were cut out so the song wouldn't get banned. Even still, the song was actually banned for a time, not only for some lyrics, but also because it had a gospel feel. Gospel being done by secular artists didn't wash in 1959. It was blasphemous. Whew, good thing those people weren't around to see rap music. Anywho, of course, what the parents hated, the kids ate up and turned this song into a crossover smash. Soon, even British bands started playing What I Say. What I Say is considered the song that birthed soul music. Plus, it's a cool song to dance to. Not gonna lie. While Ray was signed with Atlantic Records, he achieved major success by combining soul, gospel, and blues. And in the middle of 1959, Ray switched record labels to ABC Paramount Records after getting an extremely above-average-for-its-time record deal. This contract gave him a better royalties rate and also his master tapes, eventually making him one of the first black musicians to have that much control over his music and his own career. Ray also continued having big hits like the songs Georgia On My Mind and Hit the Road Jack. In 1962, he recorded what turned out to be considered one of the greatest albums in music history. Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music was Ray's experiment with country music. At the time he recorded it, racial segregation was at its peak and the Civil Rights Movement was in full swing. Racial tensions were at a boiling point, so for a black artist to do what a lot of people considered and still consider white music, quote-unquote, did not sit well with a lot of people, including some of the people on his own record label. Nonetheless, Ray pursued his idea. Once he signed an extension to his really big contract, he and his band got down to business. Sid Feller was the producer for this album. The group recorded and produced the album on February 5th and 7th at Capitol Studios in New York City and at United Western Recorders in Hollywood, California on February 15th. That was it. Three whole days. None of this taking five years to record an album like some artists do. The album was a bunch of cover songs. However, Ray put his own twist on them, including using a big band sound at times with lush string arrangements. Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music was released on April in 1962 and, thanks to a whole lot of marketing, became a huge seller right out of the gate. It spawned four hit singles, with each of them becoming big hits on the adult contemporary, country, and pop charts. In the process, Ray helped to bring country music to the mainstream. The album itself won Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards. In 2005, the Country Music Hall of Fame inducted Ray Charles for the monumental impact that modern sounds in country and western music had in helping country music cross over into the mainstream. Ray continued his career, but there were, of course, some bumps along the way, and as with a lot of artists, with the good comes the bad. 
He was arrested a few times on drug charges that last time made him go into rehab. Listen, it was either that or he had to do some time in jail. So guess which one he chose? Thankfully, though, it worked and it got him off of the drugs. Drugs didn't derail his career for a time, though. The changing music scene in the late 1960s and 70s did that. Funny thing happened, though. As time went on, Ray became respected and even revered. He began getting inducted into a lot of Hall of Fames, including being one of the first people to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with winning more than a few Legacy Awards. All of the newfound love allowed him to have a career resurgence, during which he even won another Grammy for Album of the Year, this time in 2004. There was also a movie based on his life called Ray, with Jamie Foxx winning an Academy Award for Best Actor for playing Ray. Ray Charles passed away from liver failure on June 10, 2004. The genius, Ray Charles, inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum in Nashville, Tennessee in 2005, and we have put modern sounds in country and western music and a few other choice songs onto the podcast music playlist for this week. The link, as I've said numerous times already, is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.